Hey, it's Owen Robinson, creator of Genetic Insights, Phil Younger, and the Video Nate podcast. And I am thrilled today to be joined by Craig Brocky. Uh, Craig is the best selling author of Ultimate Health Break Free from Your Health Issues and Live Your Best Life, which is a great title. Uh, he is also a serial entrepreneur, avid student, uh, a teacher who shares secrets of health, wealth, and happiness. He uh, as well as being an author of that book, he's also got some other interesting projects, uh, which we will talk about in this episode. And the reason I want to have Craig on is because he has a uh, very eclectic uh, understanding of all kinds of different health modalities, which you may have heard of and not tried, or which you may not have even heard of. And I thought it would be great to have him on today to talk about those. And he also developed a, a really interesting product to help people to have a lot more healthy probiotics in their diet and in their life at a uh, you know way more affordable price that you know doesn't involve taking supplements or anything like that. So um, those are really interesting as well. So make sure you stay tuned to the whole episode. Thank you for joining us, Craig. Thanks, Ellen. Great to be here. I'm glad we could put this together. <laughs> Excellent. Well. One of the things that people seem to love to talk about these days, that I know you and I do as well, um, is peptides, right? Absolutely, yeah. They're, they're very popular. Um, I think because you are a successful serial entrepreneur, not just a serial entrepreneur, you've had the uh, ability and means, I guess, to be able to experiment with a lot of peptides, right? That n not everyone maybe um, uh, has the ability to. And so I would love for you to share your you know, experience, like which are your favorites, which you wouldn't recommend, like how much you take, uh, you know, all of that kind of stuff, because um, we have to be careful, right? I can share what I do, but I can't tell the other person what to do. Even a medical doctor can't, because it's a case by case basis. So we can't do that, but we can say what we do, right? So I've done that before, but I'd love to hear what you do, what results you've got, um, and I guess why you love peptides and um, all that kind of stuff. Uh, just before that, let's talk a little bit about uh, like where you came from. So are you originally um, uh, like an entrepreneur? Have you been an entrepreneur your whole life or did you start off in a different field? And do you have a medical background? Like what got you into health in the first place, I guess? Yeah, well, I've been an entrepreneur my whole life. And the reason I got into health is because when I was 21 years old, I, you know, I'd wake up in bed and my chest was tight. I'd feel all full of anxiety and sick to my, sick to my stomach. And I just want to fall asleep and escape from how awful I was feeling. And, but I couldn't because my mind was already racing. And then I'd get out of bed and i walk to the, wa the bathroom and I'd look in the mirror and, and just wonder what happened because my shoulders and arms were weak, my gut was hanging out. And I was just disgusted with how I looked. My face was bloated and sad. And I could barely look at myself in the eyes. I was dominated by feelings of guilt, shame, and regret for the choices I was making and was continuing to make. And on top of this, I was living with chronic pain and I was my immune system was shot and I was sick all the time. So I quickly learned that conventional medicine did not have the answers I was looking for. In fact, I, I, I'm a bona fide, a bona fide conspiracy theorist and have been for uh, over 20 years. And the medical industry was the first one that made me question, like, wait a minute, this medical industry is intended supposedly to make people healthy, but I'm not seeing any evidence of this. It appears that the solution they're providing is to keep people on drugs and give them expensive surgeries and just keep people dependent on them for as long as they can. And it wasn't until I started looking into naturopathy and nat natural medicine where I quickly learned, wait a minute, if I address my gut health and get rid of the candida yeast and parasites and bacterial overgrowth, wait a minute, hey, my, my anxiety's gone away. That's fantastic. And way, hey, my pain's a lot better. And then it just got better and better and better. And now today I'm 50 years old. You know, people think I'm younger than I, I am. I feel great. And I'm almost happy that my, my health fell apart when I was 21 because now at age 50, I look at my friends that I grew up with and a lot of them are overweight and unhappy, stressed out, uh, on different medications and they just don't know how to take care of themselves. And that's why I wrote this book, Ultimate Health, is because I just wanted to share with people the simple solutions everybody can do that are inexpensive that will make them less dependent on the medical system and more in control of their life. Yes, I would say in the book, there's a lot of stuff there that is free and simple. We're gonna talk about the stuff that often isn't in this interview because we, you know, we, we like to cover the cut against stuff. But as you say, a lot of the, uh, the stuff that's the most effective is free and simple and, and you know, uh, not 
out of most people's reach, right? Right. And peptides, I only got into about a year and a half ago, but I did a deep dive into them. I've tried dozens of peptides. I have more dollar value of peptides in my refrigerator than I do have food, that's for sure. And I, I, I just love them because they are so profoundly powerful when used, you know, responsibly, I think. And that one of the first ones I got... And sorry, just before with, you get into that, uh, why did you decide to try them when you were already, you know, resolved your health issues, as you say, you look younger, you feel younger than your age? Like, what led you to uh, try these things? Well, I did a blood test with... Uh, Grant Cardone and Gary Brecca have this 10 health, 10x health systems uh, program. And I did a blood test and I saw that my testosterone was low. Uh, my growth hormone markers were low. And at the time I was, you know, heavier than I am now. I was about 30 pounds heavier and just not, not in the shape that I wanted to be in. So they recommended I get started with um, the ones that like using Ipamorlin and CJC1. Uh, 1295 without DAC. I mean, that's a gibberish for most people, but just growth hormone producing and, you know, boosting um, peptides, as well as uh, they recommended me try semaglutide or semaglutide, which is incredibly controversial for good reason, because, you know, people do have mixed results. And I definitely don't think it's something a person wants to be dependent on for the rest of their life. But um, I personally had a good experience with it and was able to maintain uh, the weight loss afterwards. So, and I, I've seen many people also have successes with it too. So, even though there is a lot of controversy about it, and I don't necessarily, I definitely don't mench, uh, suggest that as the first solution that someone looks at. For me, particularly, I, I liked it. And I actually, I, one of my favorites though is Melanotan One, and. Personally, why I like that one is because I'm quite fair-skinned. I grew up in Canada, and I think I have, you know, come from British British lineage. So I'm not really designed to tolerate sun very well and used to get burnt a lot and have to wear, you know, wear hats, lose, use a lot of sunscreen. And, of course, a lot of sunscreens are toxic these days. I definitely prefer to use the mineral-based ones. But now that I use Melanotan 1... I actually tan quite well and don't really have to worry too much about sun exposure. So that, for me personally, was was a big win. And, you know, most people don't have to worry about that kind of thing. Why melanotan 1? Because I understand that for tanning itself, melanotan 2 is more effective, if that's what you're after. Um, is it just that wasn't the case in your experience, or is there another reason that you like uh, melanotan 1? Well, the research I did was suggesting that melanotan 1 would give... I actually have tried both, to be honest. And um, melanotan 2 is more easy to get access to. Melanotan 1 is a little bit less common. But the research I did was that melanotan 1 gave a little bit more of a natural uh, skin pigmentation, basically. And then also with melanotan 2... It can affect your appetite as well as like reduce appetite, which is a benefit for a lot of people. But it also can uh, increase your libido and, you know, increase erections and things like that. And for me personally, that wasn't something I was particularly interested in. So I know I'm the same with uh, Milan Tattoo. It's like reduce appetite. That's the last thing I need. Uh, increased stress because it is an ACTH derivative, right? It's like, that's the last thing I need. Although, you know, for people who need that, it's great. Uh, increased sex drive, that's the last thing I need. So everything about it was like bad. And yeah, I had a really bad experience with it. Well, I turned one was not as bad, but it still didn't quite suit me. But I can see, yeah, if you really struggle to tan, um, and especially if you want to lose weight, which I guess you did at the time as well, yeah, it's a, it's a really good option. Um, I think sometimes it's also recommended for people with mold illness, although I think that's uh, you know controversial, but I think the anti-inflammatory aspect. Did you notice any anti-inflammatory effects from it personally? You know, I'm not the best to comment on that because I don't really treat myself as a science experiment and isolate one variable at a time. I like to you know, try a few different things at any given time. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, you know, like I would say being burned by the sun is an inflammatory response. So in that sense, it's already anti-inflammatory. But I just wondered if there was anything else. But, you know, if not, fair enough. I, I don't think so personally, but I have been, you know, taking BPC-157 and some other. And and one, I, actually, one of my other favorites, specifically to pain, because that was something I thought we were going to talk about, is ARA-290 or ARA-290. 
again, people who are listening right now, I don't think you need to get too significant about the names of these things, but just the, the purpose I think is more important. And ARA 290 is known to help with nerve pain. And I had a motorcycle accident in 2017. I actually fell down, I fell off my motorcycle and went down on the uh, freeway near Los Angeles where I was living at the time. And I, since that point, I had chronic pain, like nerve pain in my heel, my right foot. And what I found with was within a couple of weeks of taking ARA 290, that long-term chronic pain in my, in my foot actually went away. And it's supposed to be taken for a 30-day course. And I didn't actually buy enough to do a full 30-day course. So I didn't complete that. And what I noticed was that slowly the symptom did come back, and but lesser so, not, not as pronounced. And since then, I've also taken it again and did a full 30-day course. Again, the pain went away completely. But again, when I stopped, it did start to sneak back in a little bit. So I think my personal experience with ARA 290 is that it works profoundly well as, as you're taking it. And then maybe afterwards, maybe taking it once a week or once a couple times a week might help maintain that gains. Or maybe some people have permanent uh, solutions with it too. I'm not sure. I haven't really surveyed a lot of people about it. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, I've had some mixed stuff. It didn't help me, but then mine was quite, you know, niche case. Um, let's talk about pain. So you said you were really struggling with pain at the age of 21, right? So that's quite early. I mean, I think 50% of people over the age of 40 have chronic pain. That's my understanding. But I don't know the exact figure for 21-year-olds, but I know it's going to be a hell of a lot less. So what was your uh, pain condition? Well, I had uh, two vehicle accidents. I had a car accident where I got, uh, basically someone ran a red light and hit me from the side. And I kind of did a back and forth like this. And that gave me a little bit of whiplash. And then the following week, like to the day, um, had a boating accident where basically hit something at night and my head kind of smashed into the windshield. So I kind of had like a, a left and right injury and then a front and back injury within a week of each other. And then since that point, I had chronic neck and back pain, upper back pain. Yeah. I also so used to work. It just never healed. Yeah. And I, yeah, my body was just so messed up and I, you know, Basically, it was just really un uncomfortable. And then working on the computer a lot, and I had—I used to have really bad posture when I was working too. And I'd, I'd slouch and like, you know, I'd be working all hours building my first internet business and just, uh, you know, wrecking my, wreck, wrecking my posture and my 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 body basically. So that was that was a, a big problem. But I found that healing my gut helped with everything. So th that's something I think is just foundational for everybody and a, and a real big problem for most people because a lot of people have heard of big pharma and, you know, they're aware of that the pharmaceutical company is not really looking out for the best interests. But also big food or the food industry really isn't looking out for the best interest either. And if a person's eating any kind of level of processed foods or seed oils or, you know, sugary stuff, I mean, or they're taking antibiotics or birth control pill or, you know, there's a host of other things, a lot of stress. All these things can disrupt your gut. Uh, even diet sodas that have aspartame and all these things can just really disrupt your microbiome or your good bacteria. And then once that happens, you know, all hell can, hell can break loose with your health. So anybody who's got indigestion, gas, bloating, constipation, diarrhea, any of these things, I think you should... If you're not having other symptoms yet, consider yourself lucky and actually address the gut stuff quickly before everything progresses. And then if you have other symptoms, just know that healing your gut's probably going to help with those other things. Yeah, it's interesting. I think a lot of people um, kind of hear that the gut is the root of all health issues or a lot of health issues or whatever. And maybe a lot of people might agree with it theoretically, but I still find a lot of time when I speak to people who have a pain condition, like they have pain in their lower back or they have pain, whatever. And I say that I suspect that it is rooted in the digestive system and often like literally the organ, you know, like I, I learned this, like a lot of time if you have pain in the lower back, it's literally the small intestinal large intestine that's actually the pain. And if you, <laughs> if you resolve the infection or you resolve the gas or whatever, the, the pain will, and that's why the pain comes and goes because it's, it's actually in the digestive tract, even though it feels like it's your back or even though it feels like it's your, you know, uh, lower chest or whatever, it's, it's actually 
part of your digestive system. So it's as direct and obvious as that to me. But for some reason, sometimes, but for some reason, people don't really correlate pain with their digestive system, I think. Uh, just like often they don't correlate anxiety with their digestive system. And you just made that correlation earlier. Um, so could you share with us, uh, you know, your experience on, you know, why they correlate and how they correlate? And uh, yeah, let's do that first. And then we can talk about what we, what we can do to do it, resolve it. Sure. Okay. With pain. So I had a condition where I had candida. Well, the naturopathic doctor I was working with at the time did a series of tests and found that I had candida yeast overgrowth in my system. I don't think he was checking for SIBO or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. I don't think that was something he particularly checked for, but he definitely picked up the fungal uh, overgrowth in the, in the, in candida. And obviously a lot of people also have parasites. I mean, we all have parasites, but those can get out of control also. And in that environment, your, your gut can actually like, the lining of your small intestines is very delicate. It's, I believe, only one cell thick. And so, and then also people need to know that, like, if you look at a cross section of your small intestines, it's not a smooth tube like this. It's not like a pipe, but within that pipe, there's these things called villi, and they're kind of like these fingers that come down. And what they're doing is they're really increasing the surface area of your gut so you can absorb all the nutrients of the food that you're eating. But when a person has a compromised digestion, these villi can just get coated with mucus and fungus and bacteria to the point where they're not absorbing things properly. So even if you had a very, very clean diet and a high protein diet, you may not be absorbing that protein and the nutrients that you need to be operating with. And on top of that, your, your gut can easily produce holes in it. So then you're eating and drinking stuff that's not getting properly broken down to get actually enter your bloodstream and it's leaking into your bloodstream prematurely. And I believe that there's a strong correlation between chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, which is basically where your body hurts all over the place, like this chronic pain all over the place. And is that what you I had? Sorry, just to clarify, because you said you had pain all over. Yeah, I mean, mine was pretty localized to my neck and back, but um, I believe that when you have these, in, basically when things are leaking into your bloodstream that shouldn't be there, that all of a sudden your immune system just high, is responding to that and you get these autoimmune conditions. And pain is one of those things that can uh, surface. And obviously, so that's one aspect, I think, where you have gut health going and relating to pain. And then on the... Uh, so but by increasing inflam inflammation through that things leaking yeah, yeah exactly which, and then also your immune system, immune system. Just be, your immune system is working overtime all the time just trying to deal with these things these foreign particles that have leaked into your bloodstream and then your immune system drops because there's not a lot of you know extra resources left to handle infections and these other things that we get exposed to i believe that's why i was getting sick all the time that makes sense. Sorry, just to go back. Like you said, you were tested for candida, which I think is good. And you, as you said, you probably weren't tested for SIBO because it wasn't even a thing back then, right? When you were twenty. I don't think so. Like uh, thirty years ago, people weren't talking about SIBO. I think it's less than twenty years ago that um, that, that you know it was uh, first became a, a medical classification. Um, that you also mentioned leaky gut. Now there is something to test for that, like a zonulin peptide test. Uh, you mentioned nutrient malabsorption. There is something to test for that. There's several things, in fact, intestinal inflammation. There's several tests. I'm a big fan of testing for all those things. You did also mention that like everyone has parasites. Now, I'm familiar with like the work of Dr. Halder Clark. I've read her book, uh, The Cure for All Diseases. Um, I have to say though, there isn't like the the evidence or the ability to test that, like I think it fairly, um, fairly um, commonly doesn't show up when people do even very uh, exhaustive testing. So does this go back to what you said about conspiracy? Do you think it's, uh, there's a conspiracy for why parasites just don't show up in those testing? Or do you think that's the, the, um, the correct ability to diagnose them just doesn't exist yet, just like the SIBO didn't exist yet 20 years ago? Or, or uh, you know, what's your theory on that? Well, I, you know, I know that there are different tests, like blood tests you can do for parasites, but they're obviously only going to pick up parasites that are in the blood. I think the parasites can, you know, 
can populate the liver, for instance, and that's what Dr. Halder Clark found was she found she was testing for things, as you know, on a vibrational level and based on, you know, scanning the body for different vibrations and diagnosing based on that. So that could be considered pseudoscience for sure. Um, but what she found that with her research was that a particular liver parasite, or she called it a fluke, I think that's just another name for a particular type of, of parasite, but she found a strong correlation between liver flukes or liver parasites and cancer. And then there's also people who have had great successes using ivermectin as well as uh, actually it's, it's uh, only prescri- uh, approved for pets, but it's called fenbenzanol, I believe. Yeah. And there's a similar one for humans also, but humans, I mean, I've, I've taken it. It's safe for humans to take also. But um, these are basically anti-parasite treatments, and people with cancer oftentimes respond really well to them. So, you know, to say that they don't exist, I think, is a long stretch. And the fact that there are blood tests that will pick them up, but if they're... Well, if, but, yeah, but go ahead. Sorry, but there's different theories, like like with ivermectin, uh, and in fact, I think with fenbendazole, there's theories that you know it has that potentially miraculous effect, which it often does, maybe because it's working on viruses instead, right? Like, and viruses are certainly harder to find than parasites because they're you know so so much smaller. So that's one theory that can maybe account for why those antiparasitics are effective. This you know even if there are no parasites, that's potential, and I think that's potentially even true for. Dr. Clark's treatments, right? Your black walnut hole and your wormwood. Um, I've often said that I think sometimes maybe, uh, and I think I've done this before, like I, I understood the mechanism wrong, but I still gave the right advice so people still got better. Um, and I think that may be potentially what's going on there as well. But uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know for sure. You know, I was interested to hear what your theory is. And um, if you do believe that everyone has parasites and we just are not detecting them, then, you know, you may, you may be proven right. Yeah. We just don't know. I would say. Yeah. My personal opinion is that if a person has a healthy immune system and they're... the other thing I learned from, this is from Dr. David Minkoff. I'm sure other doctors have learned this. He has found that when your digestive system, your stomach specifically is not acidic enough. And a lot of people have that problem, especially if they take anti, um, you know, those Tums, acids, PPI, tum, tums, and, tums and Rolades, what are those called? Anti... Yeah, anti-acids. Acids, P- an- acids, right. PPI so, inhibitors. Right, yeah, a lot of people, and then there's a lot of drugs that suppress stomach acidity also. And he said, and I have to believe him, because I think he's a smart guy, he knows way more than I do, that um, when your stomach's not acidic enough, when you eat, say, a fruit or something that has some some viruses or parasites or something in them, a, a healthy gut will be like the stomach will be so acidic that it will just basically uh, break those things up and like kill them basically. But when your stomach acidity is too low, not only are you not digesting food properly, but uh, like things you're eating, foreign foreign invaders basically have a free pass to get into your digestive tract, and that's something that he his research indicates and i i think there's some truth to that on top of that i think not having an acidic gut and i think you'll be on the same page with that like if a person's for instance eat drinking a lot of liquid with their meals and diluting their digestive enzymes and diluting their stomach acid that's you know a little bit counterproductive when you're trying to actually a lot of people don't even chew their food properly and i'm i'm guilty of that too i i tend to eat quickly and not chew things enough i remember my grandparents were always like chew your food chew your food <laughs> like and i think you know that was probably great advice because a lot of people are just throwing things down they don't have the stomach acid a lot of the enzymes these days are missed because people are cooking, foods are irradiated, etc. Genetic Insights provides cutting-edge, affordable DNA testing, giving you access to over 500 health reports that can help you in three key ways. They may be able to resolve your existing health challenges even when nothing else has worked. Using simple lifestyle changes, their reports can help you reduce your risk of developing future health challenges that you may be genetically predisposed to and they can help you feel more confident in your health by showing you where you are genetically strong. Unlike most other genetic health testing companies, 
Genetic Insights tests over 83 million different variations in your genes, guaranteeing 99.7% accuracy across all of their DNA reports. They cover almost every aspect of health, including digestive issues, cardiovascular health, weight loss, hormonal and blood sugar balance, as well as nutrient needs, allergies and intolerances, and so much more. Using their system is quick and easy and reading the reports is simple. If you've done an Ancestry DNA test, you can simply download your raw DNA data, upload it to the Genetic Insights platform, and within a few hours you will have access to genetic reports which give you a risk score for each specific issue and scientifically validated recommendations based on your individual genetic profile. Everything in your reports are based on scientific studies and there are citation links throughout every report. If you are serious about optimizing your health and wellness and feeling great, then getting access to your Genetic Insights reports may be the most important health investment you will ever make. In the reports, not only will you gain insights into how to overcome existing health challenges and avoid future issues, You'll also discover which types of dietary, lifestyle, and even supplement protocols are best for your unique genetics. To get your unique genetic health reports, go to geneticinsights.co and use code rejuvenate to get 20% off today. That's geneticinsights.co using coupon code rejuvenate to get 20% off today. I think it varies a lot. I did an episode this recently. I think some people have, different people I think have different digestive systems. Some people have very strong stomachs that produce a lot of acid, but a lot of people have, you know, not strong stomachs that don't produce enough. I think, you know, it's both. And some people have very strong livers that produce a lot of bile and some people don't. And, and you know, they have very different uh, results as, as, a, as a consequence of that. Uh, but I agree with you that the issue of a, a lack of stomach acid is, you know, under focused on and under diagnosed, certainly in the mainstream world. Um, and that, can have massive consequences uh i mean i i think there are people you know like if you give a dog like a thing it'll just literally swallow it whole um and it's fine and that's because it's it's ph in its stomach is so acidic it will just <laughs> dissolve it it's not a problem and i do think there is probably a a certain category of humans that's also true for like some humans do have a stomach ph of one and um, you know, they can break down anything. And it, you know, explains why there's such different outcomes, right? Two different people can eat the same diet, one gets sick, one is fine. Um, but as you said, you gotta you gotta meet yourself where you're at. And yeah, people with uh, you know, low amounts of stomach acid production and bile production, is that a reason why parasites may start colonizing them? Definitely. And just to emphasize an example of what you said, you know, one of your presidential candidates over there currently, he claimed that he had a worm going to his brain, didn't he? Um uh, RFK Jr. You didn't hear that? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. He said that uh, he had a parasite, a worm, go into his brain um, from his digestive system and had to have it removed of surgery. So these things do happen, even to public figures who you know you've heard of. Uh, it's not that crazy. I've, I, I don't. I personally don't believe everyone has parasites, but I do think it is very weird that we acknowledge that all other mammals get parasites. We acknowledge that children get parasites. We acknowledge that people in a lot of countries throughout the world, especially the tropical countries, get parasites. But mm -hmm. for some reason, <laughs> Northern European and people with Northern European ancestors countries like the US, uh, we can't get parasites. So I think that is also ludicrous. Of course, some of us do. Uh, and, and I think it's very under ignored. I think one indication for it is the e eosinophils on a blood test. Um, and it even says that on the blood test, if you look at, you know, the, usually it gives you like a sentence description of what it means and it can indicate allergies, yes, uh, and it can indicate parasites. And I see raised eosinophils often. It's not that unusual. So, uh, yeah, I, 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 I agree it's underdiagnosed, definitely. All right, so sorry, that was a great tangent on parasites. Um, we were talking about gut health and pain um, and then we are going to talk about anxiety as well, I think. Sure, I mean... Anxiety for me was just a major problem and life just wasn't fun. It, you know, waking up every day, just the first thing, like opening your eyes or even before opening your eyes, just knowing that you're awake and just being in that state of anxiety. And it's just, it's not a fun existence. And I know a lot of people experience that. I didn't actually experience depression. That wasn't really my thing. Although I know that's quite prevalent these days, but I think people need to know that a lot of neurotransmitters, including serotonin and dopamine, which are super important ones, 
are actually produced and stored in the gut. So when your gut is unhealthy, that you know your production of neurotransmitters can be compromised and probably are compromised. And I, I, I think you sent me a great study about serotonin. I'm not, I'm not saying that a super high elevated serotonin level is necessarily important or the goal, but just having healthy neurotransmitter levels that whatever that might mean is important. And, you know, the gut does play a role in that. In fact, the American Psychological Association here in the United States, even on their website, you can, I cite the, cite, cite the article all the time. They, on their own website, say that 95% of serotonin production uh, is from the gut. So a lot of people just don't know that because they think, oh, how I feel in my head is based on my brain chemistry because that's an argument that, you know, the drug companies who are selling antidepressants and anti-anxiety medications, they're saying, oh, your brain chemistry is out. So people are just thinking brain, brain, brain. Oh, they must be made in my brain. So I should take these drugs to balance these things in my brain. And you just have to look at the whole system and the body works together in particular, the gut works with neurotransmitters, and that's just important to know. Yeah, I think the argument that they make is that that the there are definitely neurotransmitters made in the gut, right? The serotonin, dopamine, acetylcholine, the memory molecule, noradrenaline, which is the stress chemical. I don't know of adrenaline. GABA as well, which is calming. Histamine. You know, like all these things that profoundly, even histamine, we think of it as a, a allergy thing, but it's um, it's kind of similar to dopamine in terms of how it makes you feel. It's very stimulating. Um, so they all have a profound effect on how we feel. But I think the argument they make is that it kind of stays in the gut, right? That it doesn't actually affect the central nervous system because these things do have to get to the central nervous system in order to affect how you actually feel. But of course, a counter to that you've already talked about, which is that leaky gut thing, right? So if you have leaky gut, then a lot more of it can cross that barrier into the blood supply, uh, from which point it can then get to the nervous system and impact how you feel. And I 100% agree with that. I think that um, the neurotransmitters created by the uh, organisms in your gut absolutely can and do profoundly affect how you feel uh, all the time. I've experienced that myself many times, not just with me, but with many other people. Uh, you know, I was trained as a clinic hydrotherapist and People talk about the profound difference that makes. And I'm not saying kind of hydrotherapy is necessarily a good idea or the cure of anything, but it's true. When you flush the whole thing out, there's a hell of a lot less of those organisms. And at least temporarily, people feel a lot better for it in many cases because there aren't those organisms in there creating these neurochemicals that are making them feel terrible. So Right. Yeah, in chapter one of my book, I actually explained to people how they can get a similar experience to colon hydrotherapy or colonics from the comfort of their home, own home using something called a salt water flush. I call it the internal body wash in the book. And it may not be as thorough as a colonic, but it definitely also it, the water is passing through your upper intestine also. So, but so what tell I, us about I want- this. Is this similar to the Indian uh, yeah, Ayurvedic thing, the Pashikara exactly, or yeah. something? So right. tell, give people instructions who haven't heard of this. How would you do this? Okay, well, first of all, I just want to mention that the reason chapter one of my book is all about colon health is that when basically what my book's about is helping people regain their health. And a lot of people have nutrient deficiencies, so we obviously know we have to handle that. But a lot of people have toxicity as well. And we live in such a toxic world, you know, there's all these chemicals all around us. It's in our food, it's in the air, it's in the water. <laughs> like, it's just, it's really difficult. You know, if we were living 200 years ago, I don't think the health problems would be anywhere near what we have today. But we're not. We're living in a modern society with a lot of chemicals, and that's just the way it is. So we need to get these things out of our body. So we need to detoxify our liver, our kidneys, our skin, fat cells. All these things need to be detoxified. But if a person's colon is blocked, and say they're constipated and they're not even having one bowel movement a day, which a lot of people don't, if you're not getting your, your colon moving regularly, then things get backed up and it can be quite uncomfortable when a person's trying to detoxify 
their body if they're not eliminating those toxins. And you can have something called a detox reaction or a healing crisis is another term for it, where you're just, you're getting an increase of toxicity within your body as they're being released from certain areas where they've been stuck all the time. And you can get headaches and flu symptoms and all kinds of things. So that's mainly the only reason I mentioned in chapter one to focus on colon health first. And with the saltwater flush, um, we all, I think a lot of people recognize that if you were stuck on a boat in the ocean or on the sea, that you couldn't just, you know, put a glass in the, in the water, in the salt water and drink it and quench your, your thirst. I think everybody knows that you can't drink salt water. But I think maybe some people might never really consider why that is. And some might consider, well, because salt is dehydrating. and But that's not actually the reason. It's because salt water, when you drink it, has something called specific gravity. And I'm not going to get specific about that, but it basically it has a similar consistency to your blood. And when you drink that salt water, your system basically recognizes, wait, wait a minute, something's off here. And it just flushes all the way through your body. So you drink a glass of salt water and about 30 minutes later, it exits through your rear end as a liquid. And so I guess the Indians in India... Uh, developed this as a technique to flush out the, the digestive system, and especially the colon, where a lot of toxins and all kinds of nasty stuff can kind of accumulate in there, mucus and parasites and all kinds of stuff. So that's something what I've, you basically you take um, about a liter, your, your, your audience is mainly UK, I think. Yeah, right? not a US, liter, liter or quart, yeah. Yeah, a liter and a quart is pretty similar. And then I believe it's two teaspoons of salt into that liquid. And then I do say that a person should be eliminating quite regularly first. So what I suggest is having, like even if you have to take more fiber or more magnesium or more vitamin C or whatever, or even a herbal laxative, there's teas and capsules and all kinds of things to get moving like two to three times a day first. And then- and why is that? I'm sorry? Why is that? Well. I think it can be uncomfortable if you're extremely constipated and you drink that salt water and it's, 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 it can actually break through and make an exit. I think you're going to feel a lot, a lot sicker. So I just think it's a good idea to get things moving a little bit more regularly first. And then when you take that salt water the next morning, it's obviously important to be near a bathroom. But after about half an hour to an hour, that makes an exit. And then what I've, I've realized is that after about 10 minutes – Later, you can drink some more fresh water. You don't even have to drink salt water. And that fresh water, because things are kind of opened up, will actually pass through. And you can sometimes move a few few liters of water through your, your system. For some people, that might be too much. But even just that one liter can help flush out what's in your colon. And to your point, I, I found personally that I would feel a, lot, a sense of calm for like after that like everything's kind of like all that all that toxicity that's in my colon is now left or a, a great deal of it at least and now i would feel a lot you know it's great for hangovers too I, I don't you know i'm not a heavy drinker by any stretch but i definitely did do that back in the day and it can help with like the morning after and different things you know i just think it's a, it's a healthy experience to to kickstart someone's health just as if, if they can't get to a colonic or some, something like that. And you're saying several liters potentially. So are you saying several liters each with two teaspoons of salt added? Or are you saying no, only, uh, only one I of only those do, with salt? Yeah, one of those to kickstart the whole process. But what I find is that like after about 45 minutes after taking that, that first liter with the salt, that if I just drink regular water, like another liter of regular water, that will also too pass straight through. Got it. Okay, so I have a couple of objections, uh, although I'm open to it, let me just ask you. Um, the first one would be the person who's worrying, oh, isn't that a, a dangerous amount of salt, right? Like, with salt, salt is bad, is that going to raise my blood pressure too much? Is that a real concern? I don't think so, because it's making a quick exit, so I'm not sure to what extent that it is going to be absorbed. I just personally don't believe that salt is as dangerous as some of the allopathic doctors have led people to believe. Okay. Um, and is that, I guess that's part of the benefit of making sure that you're not constipated before you do it to make sure it's not absorbed, right? Because if you were, yeah, so that makes sense. Okay. I, I agree with that. I was just kind of putting it out there. I know people have been said about it. Here's more an objection that I would be thinking though. Um, 
if I'm clearing out with something like magnesium anyway, why not just do it with magnesium? What's the benefit of doing a salt over magnesium? Why not just use a tablespoon of magnesium instead? Yeah, that's a good point. Like you're obviously on top of your game. I, so, I'm, I'm, I, there may be a good answer to that. I just don't know it. <laughs> uh, but I actually mentioned in the book that if, if, you know, if a person just cannot tolerate salt water, just finds it very uncomfortable, that you can use vitamin C, ascorbic acid works fine. Uh, magnesium also works well too. So, um, so there's no there's no benefit to using uh, salt over magnesium. Other I'm than not being sure, cheaper, you know, I guess. <laughs> yeah, maybe cheaper. I mean, it's definitely more studied. Like the the oh, salt water. Pr- well, that goes back to you know hundreds of years in India. So that's just kind of the way they were rolling with it. Maybe they were also using magnesium and vitamin C. I don't know, but I know subscribe like listeners. You need to know that. When you take vitamin C, some some uh, naturopathic doctors will tell you to take the vitamin C to bowel tolerance. I've I've had given been given that instruction before, and that's just like you can actually get IVs of vitamin C, and that's a way to actually get a really high dose of vitamin C because of this bowel tolerance issue. You can't just take 10, 10 grams of vitamin C orally and expect to feel okay because <laughs> your body just overreacts to it and wants to get rid of it. So, um, whereas you can take an IV, I don't know to, to what degree you can take, de- you can definitely get a lot more vitamin C in through an IV than you can orally because of this. I think you do like 30 grams in an IV, I think sometimes I've seen that. So yeah, definitely more. Yeah, with vitamin C, I've got a theory that the re- it often is effective if people are starting to feel unhealthy, like a cold coming on or whatever, but I wonder how much of the effect is simply the laxative effect. Like Interesting. For what you're talking about, you're just clearing out all those toxins, everything inflammatory, right? And then, of course, you're going to feel better for, for all the reasons that you've just talked about for the last 10 minutes. Maybe it's not immune system boosting. Maybe it's just the flushing effect. Uh, so that's my little theory. <laughs> I like it. And, and, uh, and speaking of colds and flu, obviously, that's super common. My personal favorite, and I'd like to hear what your favorite is too, but my personal favorite is oil of oregano. I've had so many good successes with that. And you can act, it's very spicy, so the, the liquid you can get and you put drops in your mouth or in water, it's very, very spicy. But you can actually get capsules that have oil of oregano. Usually it's mixed with uh, olive oil or some other type of oil too. But to me, that's the bazooka of cold and flu remedies and will just knock things out super fast. So what's your, what's your personal favorite for colds and flu? I think that's a good recommendation. I think olive oregano, grapeseed extracts, garlic those are probably like the most broad spectrum kind of kill everything uh, uh, things out there so i think that makes sense um god i haven't had a cold in so long what would i do probably what i said actually like a large dose of vitamin c and really what you just said actually like do a flush what you just said do a flush would be my number one recommendation whether using salt magnesium or vitamin c i think that's probably the most impactful thing you can do Cool. Yeah. I mean, I've studied some of your work and it seems like you have a really diverse background also. And I, I love that you're into peptides and stuff. And if you want to talk more about that, that's cool too. <laughs> yeah, we could go back to peptides. Well, let's talk a bit more. We were going to focus on pain, as you said. And I do think let's do a little bit more. All right. So someone's in pain. They're listening to this. Um, they've got that. They should be focusing on their gut health. Um, We've given some advice for that, but let's let's give some more. So, you know, olive oregano, that can kill a lot of organisms. It's pretty safe, so that's good. We talked about doing a flush. That's good. I've talked about the importance of testing, which you agree with, although, you know, we're not 100% sure if it's really effective for parasites, so you might want to try doing parasites anyway. We've given some advice for that, so that's good. Uh, what else would you recommend to people for pain? Well, for pain, you touched on something that was super important, and of minerals, a lot of people hear calcium, calcium, calcium. You need to take calcium for your bones, blah, 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 blah. But what people don't hear a lot about is magnesium. And for me, uh, magnesium's as important or more important. And I explain things in the book that calcium can have a tightening effect in the body. Obviously, if you take a high, high dose of it, it can also have like a laxative effect too. But um, magnesium is good for loosening up your muscles and also your nerves. It's, it's Magnesium is just wonderful stuff. And I think that's a super important mineral for people to take. Another one is sulfur, actually. And a lot of people don't think of sulfur too much. But there's an excellent uh, supplement on the market called MSM. And that's an organic sulfur. And 
not only can it loosen up your muscles and, and relieve stiffness and pain, but it also can help your body absorb and hold on to more oxygen. In my opinion, I mean, there's arguments for why carbon dioxide is good for your body too. And I don't think you want to have a complete absence of carbon dioxide, but I also believe that oxygenation is something that a lot of people probably don't have enough of and they have too much acidity in their body. Well, so carbon I, dioxide helps with oxygenization, right? They're, they're not contrary, they're mutually beneficial. Right. Yeah. So by no stretch do I think someone needs an absence of, of, of either, but of the two, I'm all about focusing on how, how you can get more oxygen in your body. And I talk about that in chapter two. Chapter two is all about oxygen therapies. And you actually, before we, we, we talked. Yeah, I wanted uh, to talk to you about a specific type. Um, so this is called, oh yeah, you tell us about Ibu. it. Please. I mean, the most, the, the str strongest oxygen therapy I'm aware of that I've done personally is Ibu, which stands for extra corporeal, corporal blood ozonation and oxygenation extracorporeal meaning outside the body so basically it's an ozone machine and ozone is just uh o with a three on it so the air that we breathe has o2 in it and ozone gas is o3 so it's got an oxygen extra oxygen uh atom that makes it highly reactive so it will kill bacteria, parasites, all similar to how hydrogen peroxide, I don't know, a lot of first aid kits used to have hydrogen peroxide in it and you'd use it to, to, to sanitize a cut before you'd put a Band-Aid on it. That was quite common. A lot of people use rubbing alcohol or iodine, but hydrogen peroxide is one of those things also. Hydrogen peroxide, just for the listeners, I know you know this, Ellen, but it's just hydrogen and then instead of H2O, it's H2O2. And again, it's got this extra oxygen atom on the molecule that's highly reactive. And so these highly reactive oxygen forms can kill bacteria, parasites, viruses. And they can also super oxygenate your body as well. So there's a lot of different ozone treatments, and I mentioned a lot of them in the book, and some of them are very un, uh, un, inexpensive. You can actually get your own ozone machine at home that can create a medical-grade ozone gas just with an oxygen tank, and you don't even have to use medical oxygen. You can use industrial oxygen. There's just different solutions. But anyway, the most expensive and strongest one that I did, I actually had to use, I used to have to go down to Mexico to do it because... It's not FDA approved and people didn't want to do this 15 years ago. But nowadays, here in Clearwater Beach, Florida, or Clearwater, Florida, near Tampa, there's actually three different places that have Ibu machines now. So it's, it's become more common here. But what it is, is basically they put a catheter in one arm and you have your, your, your blood coming out. And usually it's like a dark purple color. And then it goes through this machine that just infuses it with ozone gas, and then it goes through a very uh, high-quality filter to take out any garbage that shouldn't be in there. Yeah, it's very and powerful it, for detoxifying as well. Because I, I think I've done I've done ozone IV therapy, and it was okay. But I like the idea of this, especially because the filtration seemed incredible. Yeah, right. And then so and then it goes into the other arm. So it's this closed loop system where all your blood is getting ozonated is it also ultraviolet light as well you can have ultraviolet light too some guys will even put methylene blue into the blood on the way back so there's a lot of different ways people can modify it but it's just you can do it to the point where the blood coming out is no longer dark purple but is actually bright cherry red so basically everything your whole blood's just super oxygenated it's almost like getting new blood in a way and that's super strong and that's super important because your blood really affects how you feel. You know, the whole vampire thing, the blood is the life, is uh, very accurate. Like, you can have all kinds of toxicity, but if they're in storage in your cells, they will undermine your health to some degree, but they won't massively impact how you feel. And this is how people go along, you know. Often they're very sick, but they don't, they're not even aware of it because it's not in their blood. But once something is in your blood, you definitely feel it, right? Especially if it crosses the blood-brain barrier, but even if it doesn't. Um, and so I can imagine, although I haven't had the experience, that if you do something like this and you remove, you know, everything toxic from, I think it's the, it's all the blood that it filters, right? Not just a leaf yeah, or something. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it runs until, like, 
you can do for various lengths of time. It's usually a minimum of 45 minutes that you're actually on this machine. Sometimes it can be longer. So potentially it does all your blood at least. Yeah. So how, like, do you, I imagine it impacts how you feel, but you tell me, how do you feel? What's the difference? Yeah, well, my personal feeling about any oxygen therapy, even if it's just a series of deep breathing, and uh, there's a very famous guy named Wim Hof, and I know Gary Brecka, who's a very big fan of Wim Hof and recommends people do deep breathing. If you do any of these things, or if you breathe, even if you breathe uh, pure oxygen before doing a sporting activity, it definitely increases your performance. You have just more, like that lactic acidosis that you can get when you're exercising has, a, like, your body delays that by a long margin. So, um, and just energy is a lot higher. But what I found was with Sorry, the... Can, can, we, can we double click on that? So. Even Wim Hof, he would say that, you know, in Wim Hof methods, yes, he does the very intense extra breathing, but then he, he does always follow it or almost always follow it with a breath hold to build the CO2 back up again, because being in a CO2 depleted state is not ideal. So are you, from, I think, even his perspective, so is that what you're talking about? Or do you think it is beneficial to blow off all your carbon dioxide and just leave it reduced by, by over breathing? Uh, or well, by ex extra he, breathing, maybe. He's studied it more than I think most people. So I think what he's suggesting would probably be the best way to go about it. I'm, another guy I like a lot is Dr. Mercola, and he's controversial too. He was one of the top 12 doctors that during COVID, they were like, misinformation, misinformation, the dangerous dozen of doctors. But. Yeah, he became a fan of Buteco a few years ago, I believe. So he was really into the importance of CO2 as well, right? I don't know if he's yeah, changed his fact, mind since. I, I saw him have an article why Wim Hof method could be not necessarily a good thing. But, you know, that's the, that's the thing I think almost anybody who's listening to this can relate to is that there's so much conflicting information out there. And you can get an argument for one thing and then you can get an argument for almost the opposite. And it's really difficult to discern what's what's truth and what's fiction and oftentimes yeah i always try to work out rather than trying to work out who's right and who's wrong i always try and work out like what's the context that one is right and what's the context that one is wrong so for instance you know one of the, this is why my one of my specialties or really my main specialty is genetics because different people have different capacities like even in um you know a recent episode i did about the korean body types they talk about some people it's beneficial for them to uh, do very long breathing in and some types it's very beneficial for them to do very long out breath for some types it's very beneficial to do a lot of breathing for some of them it's beneficial to do breath holds like so I, I, I don't think it's a case of is Wim Hof right or this or that I think it's a case of who is Wim Hof right for and who is a Buteco right for it's more like yeah rather than I, I mean sometimes I guess people are just wrong and that's also possible but whenever you get two groups of people who both have a lot of followers saying, this is great, this really works for me, um, you know, I try and work out why, you know, rather than disbelieving either of them, if that makes sense. So that's why I'm asking these questions. So I'm saying, you know, okay, so if you like it, have a lot of oxygen, that's fair enough. I'm, I'm wondering, you said, you know, you do the do breathing, like, do you do the breath hold afterwards or do you find that unnecessary? Yeah, yeah, I do that. And um, also I find that taking MSM or this organic sulfur also helps because it just helps your body hold on to more oxygen itself. Um, if you look at the periodic table of elements, there's not many on there that are very closely linked to oxygen. Sulfur happens to be one of them and they have a high affinity for each other. So not only do you get the benefits of this, you know, softening of the muscles and tight muscles and pain and so on, but it just, I mean, there's a great book called Flood Your Body with Oxygen, and that's actually what I named the second chapter of my book. is called Flood Your Body with Oxygen. And I have to give credit where credit is due. There's an author named Ed McCabe, and he spent decades doing research into oxygen therapies, and that's where I learned most of what I learned. I mean, I've also experimented firsthand with a lot of these things as well. But um, Ed was the one that did the research about MSM and how it helped super oxygenate the body or oxygenate it more than it would be as a lot of people who are listening to your show probably know that crops these days like minerals actually come typically from either salt uh like mineral salt like himalayan salts sea salt but also crops and but the food industry like agriculture 
only puts three minerals, and these minerals are actually derived from petroleum, so they're not really a natural source of 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 minerals and and that was potassium what are they npk nitrogen potassium and phosphorus right so those are the only three minerals that the agriculture industry is actually putting onto the soil never mind these you know dozens of other trace minerals and other things that would be healthy to put in there so the food that we're eating is so mineral depleted because just again for your listeners i know you know this stuff but um and a lot of your listeners probably do too but Plants, plants can, make, can make vitamins, but they can't make minerals. So the minerals actually have to be drawn up through the roots into the, into the plant. They don't actually manufacture minerals. So when you, when you don't have minerals put in, the plants don't have the minerals. And so the, you know, sulfur is actually one of these important ones. And there's many other trace minerals that are super important also. And I recommend people take trace minerals daily, as I'm sure you do too. Yeah, uh, you know, and I guess animals eat plants, right? And I know a lot of my followers would say, well, that's why I eat a lot of animals, <laughs> animal food, because, uh, you know, they will have concentrated those. And I guess you don't really have to worry about sulfur much if you're eating a lot of animal foods because they tend to be higher in sulfur. Um, but, yeah, I guess it depends, case-by-case case basis. Um, so to go back to the EBO2, you said, you know, there's benefits to all oxygen therapies. So is there anything specific about it that you felt more beneficial than other oxygen therapies? Um, well, it's just that it's a quantity thing because the predecessor, pre, predecessor, the earlier version of that, Picasso. basically, they t- yeah, they take about a pint of blood out and then they oxygenate, basically they remove about a, pl- a pint of blood from one arm, goes into basically a sterilized glass container, and then they infuse ozone into that small container, swirl it around a little bit, and then you then use an IV and drip that back. That's called auto-hemotherapy. Oh, like, tri- oh, so, yeah, predecessor was the right way then. Right, so that was like the thing that they did before they discovered the EPO2. Now I get it. Yeah, and yeah. so you're only doing about a pint, a pint of blood, whereas with Ibu, you're doing liters of blood. I don't know what the capacity of blood in the body is, but you're doing almost every drop of blood in your body. Now there's another oxygen therapy that exists today that didn't back then, or maybe it did, I just wasn't aware of it. I think, believe it was developed in Hungary um, and it's called Cocoon. Um, it's spelled K-A-Q-U-N, Cocoon. And these, these are actually, and I honestly don't understand how the technology works, but basically they're oxygen baths where they fill the, the bath water with this special water that allows the the oxygen to penetrate through your skin at a higher rate than normal water would. And that can super oxygenate the body. I have a friend who was struggling with Lyme's disease for quite some time and she couldn't find any solution. And she had massive relief from doing these cocoon baths. She did them every day, so it was a huge commitment. But um, that's something that also can super oxygenate the body that I personally haven't experienced that one, but I mentioned in the book. Mm, okay. Um, I think back to pain, the, uh, uh, the only ozone therapy I f- am familiar with that I've done that is for pain is prolozone therapy. Yeah, I've done that also. Inject ozone into you, yeah. Um, but would you, I think I know the answer to this, but I just joined the connection with people. Would you say that uh, any kind of oxygen therapy is beneficial for pain? I would think so, but maybe that's a generalization. Like you've said that not everything works for everybody. So I think, you know, people need to try something and if they get a response, yeah, if they have a response from it. So sorry, we've talked about a lot of the cutting edge ones. What's a good starter thing for people then who are like for them to test the water and see if it's a thing that helps them? What would you recommend? When it it comes to pain or just uh, oxygen? Uh, Let's start with pain, yeah. Okay, so pain, in my opinion, something that's super inexpensive is MSM, organic sulfur. And I have a protocol in there that was based on Ed McCabe's book that I think if people take it at a, a much higher level than their, you know, just it's not just one or two capsules a day. If they take multiple capsules a day, I think that they can have a profound ex- experience from that, from a pain perspective. And then obviously there's things like curcumin, and there's other, there's so many. No, no, sorry. I, 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 was, I was saying like an oxygen therapy that a person could start with. I know sulfur is related to oxygen, but some people have bad 
reaction to sulfur. Like, what's an introduction to ozone or, or something like it, I guess, is what I meant. I mean, I think prolozone, which is basically they're injecting... Um, I've had neurotherapy too. I don't know if you've done that before, which is injections that helps like release tightness in muscles, but that's not, it's not oxygenated. The, the prolozone that I did was basically like neurotherapy where they are injecting uh, a local anesthetic along with usually uh, a homeopathic. So the local anesthetic is collapsing the muscle. And actually, I used to have a lot of tightness in my jaw. The reason I'm pointing at my jaw is because I used to clench a lot and grind, grind my teeth, bruxism. And I used to have a lot of tightness in here. So I've actually, I used to get injections in here with uh, neurotherapy where they would release the tightness of the muscle instantly because it's got this local anesthetic. So just boom, the muscle just lets go. And then there's usually a homeopathic like Arnica and these types of things in there to help with the inflammation. And then the prolozone that I did, and I've only done it with one clinic, so I'm not sure if it varies from place to place, is then afterwards they actually inject ozone gas straight into that that area yeah and yeah I don't, that's right. my understanding of what prolozone is yeah 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 so that's that was my experience so that can be helpful for people um as and i guess that's more of on the expensive side though because you're actually doing it in a clinic with a nurse or who's trained in that so it's not definitely not the most affordable solution so i think you know someone taking more magnesium and healing their gut taking more uh, vitamin C, taking more, uh, what do you call it? Or uh, MSM, heavy, like deep breathing, like Wim Hof breathing. I think those things are probably like the affordable side that can give people some relief. In an ideal world, you'd meet all of your nutritional needs in the form of vitamins, minerals, phytonutrients, and more from the foods you eat. However, unless you prepare all of your food at home from scratch using the highest quality ingredients possible, the reality is that most of us need some nutritional support. Most of us need to take supplements if we want to look, feel, and perform at our best on a consistent daily basis. And this is especially true if you have genes that give you an elevated need of certain nutrients. And this is where Feel Younger can help. What I love about Feel Younger is that they offer a huge range of quality supplements and healthcare products formulated and endorsed by Owen Robinson, including must-haves like magnesium glycinate and vitamins B12, D3, and K2. And they do it at affordable prices with free shipping for orders over $50 without ever compromising on quality, purity, or potency. To learn more about how Feel Younger supplements can give your health a boost while supporting this podcast, please visit feelyounger.net and use promo code rejuvenate to get 20% off your first order. That's promo code rejuvenate for 20% off your first order at feelyounger.net. We were going to talk about, um, let's see yeah so back to the gut let's talk about uh your one of your entrepreneurial ventures <laughs> to help people with gut health well so i was struggling with my weight like um not obese by any stretch but just not able to get my weight where i wanted it so i was actually in my chiropractor's office a couple of years ago and she said you got to read this book called super gut and it's written by New York Times number one best-selling author named Dr. William Davis. What Dr. Davis, he's a cardiologist, actually. And he discovered in his practice that there was a one-for-one -one relationship between uh, heart problems with some sort of either diabetes, pre-diabetes, or insulin resistance. He, he was found like, okay, people with heart problems also have problem with their blood glucose and, and, and insulin. So then... He was trying to get to the bottom. Well, why is that? And he found that the wheat, at least in the United States, and how it's produced, was causing people a lot of problems. And he wrote a book called Wheat Belly. And I actually haven't read that series of books, but it became quite famous, called Wheat Belly. And then so what his theory was, and what he put into practice with his patients was avoid wheat and see how you do. And a lot of people responded really, really well from that but that not everybody did. And then so he looked further, well, why are these people who are not responding, what's going on there? And then he got really into the gut microbiome and the bacterial condition of your gut. And a lot of people need to realize that when they take antibiotics, uh, most that I'm familiar with, most antibiotics are, are non-selective, meaning that they just 
are killing all kinds of bacteria, good bacteria and bad bacteria. And then it kind of leave, leaves the door open for bad bacteria to take over, which is what SIBO is when you have too much small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. These are the bad bacteria. And you can also have fungus and, and parasites and all kinds of problems. But anyway, he focuses mainly on SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And he explains how to test for that using a breath analyzer. Anyway, he started experimenting with different strains and species of probiotics. And a lot of people know that things like yogurt have probiotics in them, but the run-of-the-mill normal yogurt that's in the grocery store typically only has two species of probiotics, and they don't even populate the small intestine. They only populate the large or intestine or colon. So he got really deep into this, and he wrote a book called Super Gut, and he gives many recipes in it for different probiotics that you can make, and you can actually make your own probiotic yogurt. So I got really interested in this. Interested in this and, and sorry, actually, just to clarify, yeah. aren't all yogurts have some probiotics, as you say? So what's yeah, the difference? Unless, unless they're pasteurized after the fact, which most people... That's the other thing is if your yogurt is made with pasteurized milk, that's okay because the pasteurization kills the bacteria, but then they introduce new bacteria and then they culture it. So if you see something that says pasteurized, made with pasteurized milk, that should be okay as long as it says with live cultures, basically. But um, getting back to the point, most probiotic yogurt is, uh, sorry, most yogurt that you get in the grocery store only has two strains or species. And then also on top of that, it's usually only fermented for about six to eight hours. Well, what Dr. D Davis realizes, well, if I use these very specific strains and species and actually, and I ferment it for 36 hours, so a full day and a half, the probiotic count towards the end just starts going like this and like hockey sticking. So it's orders of magnitude stronger, plus they're very specific species that you're reintroducing to your gut. And he's identified which ones have different benefits. Anyway, on top of all that, so I started doing this at home and having great results. I've and sorry, given it to, before you share your story on this, um, could you tell us a bit more which ones have the specific benefits? Can you tell us a bit more about that? Well, there's a the, the strain that Dr. Davis likes the best, or species rather, is called L. Rudery. I, I mistakenly use strain and species back and forth. It's not actually, they're not synonyms. Uh, a species is like a, a larger group, and then a strain is a spe is within a species. So anyway, the species L. rutery is one that Dr. Davis has studied per a lot, and he's found a strong correlation between that and the production of oxytocin. And I know you and I both are big fans of oxytocin, which is the love hormone or feel-good home hormone, helps with feelings of empathy, love, closeness, um, also how it has an anabolic effect. It's really good for skin health. So it's got like many, many benefits. It can help with human growth hormone production. So l rutery is one that he absolutely loves. And then he combines it for if you want to lose weight, there's one called l Gassery. And Dr. Mercola actually makes a really good brand of that. You can buy it on Amazon. Um, for the l rutery actually Dr. Davis has just come out with his own version of that. But prior to that, he was recommending a very specific strain. Again, actually it was two, two strains within the species of L. rutery. And he it, the brand is called BioGaia and the product is called Gastris. So that is the one that he was testing mostly, but now he's developed his own. And then there's a third, uh, the name is escaping me, but it's more for inflammation. So he found that when he combined those three species together and those specific strains within those species, that those could help counteract SIBO effectively. So that's something that he recommends in the book. And then there's other ones like, for instance, GLP-1 is something that a lot of people hear about because of Ozempic, semaglutide, Wagovi, these weight loss and diabetes drugs. So what those do is they stimulate the production of GLP-1 in the system. But there's actually a probiotic on the market that's called a GLP-1 probiotic that is said 
to actually help your body naturally produce more GLP-1. And that's why I don't recommend Ozempic and Wagovi to people right off the bat, because your body's actually supposed to produce GLP-1 naturally. So if you can actually heal your gut and maybe put those probiotics in there that actually produce GLP-1, maybe you can avoid having to take semolutide altogether and actually lose weight naturally, especially if you're doing some exercising, eating properly, maybe some intermittent fasting or maybe taking some berberine or metformin at the most if you need to take a drug. You know, those maybe are more moderate ways of starting because if you take semaglutide, at least at the way that doctors recommend it, it it can really cause nausea and all kinds of problems because it just suppresses your appetite to such a large degree. especially And, s- and slows your digestive system, which le- can easily lead to SIBO, right, as well as more severe problems. So... I think what you're saying is very wise, yeah. And I'm a big proponent of, you know, Berberine is something I sell on Feel Younger. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So you said it's your best seller, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Very popular. It's something I use myself on an ongoing basis for its uh, um, insulin, you know, optimizing effects. Very effective. Last time I had insulin checked, it was below two, which I think is as opt- optimal as it gets. So I think it works. Um, so those strains are very interesting. I hadn't heard of some of those. Um, so you said a person could uh, learn more about it in your book as well as, what's his name, Dr. Davis? Supergut. Supergut is a book I recommend everybody read. Okay. Um, I'm not a competitor to Dr. Davis. I love the guy and I, I send everybody his way also. And he, he actually recommends people to buy our ultimate brand uh, probiotic yogurt maker. I was going to say, so yeah, you have a way if people actually, because the one problem with these, uh, I know with El Ruteri, for instance, it can be pretty expensive, right? If you want a high enough dose for it to be effective to, you know, significantly raise oxytocin, it's going to cost a lot of money if you're just buying pills. Right. The specific one that he was recommending is uh, about $24 for 30 tablets. And to make make a, a batch of probiotics, for that particular one, you use 10 tablets, he recommends, because they're not super strong. But I've also made probiotic yogurt with many different brands of probiotics that you buy off Amazon or any place. And usually you only have to take one capsule and open it up, put it in your bowl, and then you put in a little bit of uh, cream usually or, or whole milk it also works well. You can use nut milks and other things, but it's not as, as a uh, consistent in terms of the result, a little trickier to work with, but half and half dairy works really well, like like the coffee cream, and super rich. It's almost like a um, Greek yogurt, and you don't even have to strain it. And then whole milk works out really really well. Goat's milk will also work for those who are dairy intolerant. But I do want to mention, I gave one of my uh, really good friend of mine, I gave him a yogurt maker, uh, the copy of Super Gut, and he, dairy intolerance was one of his issues. And his 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 girlfriend uh, spouse uh, I think I don't think they're married yet but his uh, fiance at the time uh, made yogurt with Dr. Davis's recipe using dairy and he was able to tolerate that because uh, when you ferment dairy it gets rid of lactose and lactose is something lactose is the sugar that's in that's in milk and it gets rid of the lactose the probiotics actually feed off of the lactose and on top of that you add prebiotics into the mix so that the probiotics have even more food so they don't just exhaust the lactose they continue growing because you're putting prebiotics in there and that's part of the reason that dr davis is able to get this huge probiotic count but the cool thing is that after just two weeks his dairy intolerance went away and now he can he can handle handle dairy so that was one of the really cool wins that just someone close to me had with the yogurt maker, but it makes it super affordable to get probiotics and it makes them stronger and allows you to select which ones you want to use for what purpose. So you get a lot more control on the whole thing than just taking some broad spectrum probiotic or going to the yogurt yogurt departments in your grocery store and thinking that that's going to solve your problems. <laughs> yeah, very interesting. Uh, so that sounds like a great resource. Um, I suppose technically anyone can make yogurt at home, but your your device makes it easy, right? Right. The How whole point. Work? Yeah. So the two things that are important with yogurt, well, the the main thing is temperature control. You want to a lot of probiotics thrive at ninety nine degrees Fahrenheit, which is or ninety eight point six, which is body temperature. So a lot of them do really well at that temperature. 
So you don't want something that runs at say 110 degrees or 120 degrees because they can actually kill the probiotics and that's counterproductive obviously. You wanna maximize the probiotic count. So our ultimate probiotic yogurt maker is very good with temperature control. And then additionally, you want something that can keep it at that temperature for 36 hours. Uh, ours runs to 48 hours, so beyond what you would need. Anyway, those are the two the two main things, and something that's easy to use, easy to clean. And then we explain. We've got all kinds of training videos and a quick start guide, and we give all the information, and recipes a person would need, and make it super easy. That sounds really awesome. Um, and so, do you have a website for that, or is it like on Amazon or? Yeah, I mean, our brand's ultimate. Um, if you go to amazon.com forward slash ultimate, you can find all our products. We have <clears throat> the domain name ultimate.club, not .com, but ultimate.club is our domain name also. And if someone wants my book, it's craigbrocky.com. They can actually download uh, the first chapter for free at craigbrocky.com slash free. If they want to learn how to use semaglutide or Zempic responsibly, I've got a free guide on there. If they want to learn about peptides, I've got a, the ultimate peptide cheat sheet on there. They can download for free. I try to be as useful as I can for people. That's nice. Great resources. Just before you finish, let's talk about uh, one thing you reminded me of earlier that, as you said, we're both a fan of, and that's oxytocin. Um, we've said, you know, you can get it from yoga. Uh, but, you know, again, there is that barrier between the gut and the, uh, and the brain, so you might not feel it as much as actually using a peptide. Um, so what's your experience with oxytocin as a peptide? I think oxytocin as a peptide, one of the things you can say about it is one of the most cost effective, right? Like it, you get a hell of a lot for uh, your dollar when it comes to feeling good and, and all the other health benefits you've talked about. So yeah, how do you use it? Like uh, I saw you did a video, for instance, on using it for sleep, which is not how I'd used it, but I'm very open to it. So how do you use it? What type do you prefer? Where do you get it from? How much do you use? How often do you use it? All of it, give us a full guide, please. Yeah, I'd love to. So oxytocin is one of my favorites too, much like yourself. I like how it makes me feel. And I also find I'm sorry, that- Sorry, quick question. Sorry? Did you ever check to see if you're genetically low in oxytocin by any chance? I did not. So I'm very interested in your work and learning more about that. Yeah, yeah. I, that's, I, I think, I mean, it's beneficial for everyone, but I think it's, it's almost like a, a salve or a panacea, like something you desperately need if you are genetically low in it, like you feel really good. So it'd be interesting to test that for you and see if that theory yeah. holds. But anyway, you know, sorry, I, I, carry on. I noticed that some people are more empathetic than others too. So I, I wonder if there's that connection or not. And tending to addiction, I think, like, oxytocin makes people more prone to addictive tendencies i bet yeah for sure anyway uh, my personal way favorite way of using it is in a nasal spray um and there's a in the u.s you can get it online without a prescription you can get it with a prescription it's obviously a lot more expensive with a prescription but then you get to work with like a telemedicine doctor um, I can't think of the name of the one off the top of my head, but there's one I've seen with that. Or you can buy it as like a, a research chemical that's not for human consumption, and those are non-regulated. Uh, so, um, but you can get these nasal sprays. The one I buy is usually from um, a company called LimitlessBiotech.com. I am an affiliate. I, if, if you go there, you can save 20% if you use CB20. CB20 at Limit, Limitless Biotech will get you 20% off. But they have oxytocin spray, nasal spray. And I like to use it personally. I like to use uh, a spray or two after a workout because I saw a whole podcast from a doctor who specializes in peptides and she was touting the anabolic effects. And I know Dr. Davis in Supergut, he talks about how l rutery and how when it produces more uh, oxytocin, how that's really good for muscle uh, development as well. So I'll use it after uh, workouts, not all the time, but sometimes. I have used it before sleep. And obviously it can be helpful before intimacy as well, uh, helping you know raise that connective level if people need that. As well as physically, right? It improves blood flow and, you know, for people for whom that's an issue. Um, it, I would say be careful if you already have a tendency for being premature, let's just say, uh, especially as a man because it can make that worse because it is so uh, stimulating. Um, what kind of dose do you, and again, this is not medical advice for everyone watching, this is two people just having a little chat about what they personally do. Because um, when I first got um, 
into an laser oxidized sickness from a company called Science, which I don't think offers it anymore. And theirs was like 50, milli, no, 50 micrograms per spray, which is really high. And I know that I'm pretty sure the limitless one that you just recommended is only five micrograms per spray. Um, so like uh, uh, five is not that impactful. 50 is way too strong though, I would say. Uh, but that's my experience. I'm interested to hear what you think. Basically what the cheat sheet here is, I know 100, 100 micrograms is common in a spray. You can get 50 as well. Those are kind of like the two common I thought Limitless strengths. was five. Let me look this up. They actually supply it. Um, you have to mix it yourself, so they supply the solution. Uh, sorry, I mean five per spray at the strength that they provide. Maybe not. Maybe I'm wrong. Yeah. So I've seen it. I believe 100 micrograms is kind of like the starting, like one spray, which can be strong for some people. So, I mean, 50, I think, is might be the lowest I've seen. What have you seen? Sorry. Yeah, maybe I'm getting confused then. Maybe it's 500. Oh, yeah, no, it was. That's what it was. It was 500, the one I originally had. 500 wow. milligrams per spray. So like half half a milligram. Yeah. That's strong. It was too strong. Um, yeah. <laughs> then I diluted it by half and one spray was plenty. Um, but okay, so that makes more sense. Yeah. Um, so I say this because there is a wide range. I've seen products that are so weak they do nothing. And I've seen products, well, like the one I just said, that's so strong that even one spray was too much. So I think dosing is quite important. And yes, I think you're absolutely right that like 100 or maybe starting with 50 uh, would be good, sensible. Right. I think Limitless sells two sizes. I think they sell a five milligram one and a 10 milligram one. So if you bought the five milligram one and use the same amount of solution, you'd start with that 50 microgram uh, dose in, in a single spray. And then if you got the larger size one, you'd get a hundred micrograms and, and a microgram, you know, a lot of people don't think about micrograms, but they know what milligrams are and you're just, you know, chopping things up in smaller numbers basically yeah a microgram is a thousandth of a milligram or a millionth of a gram so yeah so the amount i was having as you said is half a milligram yeah which what's, is too much that's the th really cool thing about peptides is that the dosage is so small i think like in terms of yeah like the starting dose for semaglutide the ozempic wagovi is 0.25 milligrams for a week <laughs> it's like <Yeah>. what <laughs> <laughs> a quarter of a milligram for a whole week wow <laughs> um do you is there any caution about oxytocin do you think people can overdo it either in terms of too much at once or doing it too frequently um i don't know i i personally just like to use it sparingly personally i don't like to get dependent on anything especially if it has an emotional uh impact on me so that's my personal opinion on it. I like to use it after workouts, sometimes to relax before sleep. And those are kind of like the main applications. And I'll have, uh, sometimes I'll go, you know, weeks without using it. So, or I'm traveling and I don't bring it with me. It's not, I don't think anything should become habit forming for a person. Yeah. Uh, and and I don't think it is. I think it's one of those things that's not habit forming at all for whatever reason. I think because it actually builds up in your system. So at some point you become satiated. Um, I was more, you know, I don't know if you had any negative effects. When I looked it up, it said, you know, excessive levels can... It definitely raises your heart rate. I don't know if you've noticed that, for instance. Wherever your heart rate is after you take it, it'll go up by like 20 points, um, which is... But it also can help you sleep, which is interesting. So, you know, let's say your heart rate is 60, you take it, it'll be 80, but you're more easily able to get to sleep, which is counterintuitive. But... Uh... I do want to mention just before, I love this peptide, um, and... I think it was one that maybe you weren't didn't have a great experience with, as I recall. But there's also a nasal spray for it's called C Lank. And oh no, me, I like C Lank. I'm good with that. Yeah, mm -hmm. me personally, I found that one to be quite relaxing. It's it's known to help with anxiety. It's, again, anxiety is not a huge issue for me. But honestly, I like coffee in the morning. I, I, maybe one of my remaining vices. But I don't necessarily think coffee is the worst thing. But I do sometimes drink like two or three cups in the morning. And what I found was that that the the, the physical, re physical reaction from the caffeine would kind of raise my heart rate and kind of almost give me that negative feedback like I'm nervous or it would almost be anxiety forming for me in a way when I would take that extra boost of caffeine. And what I found with what with C-Lank is, is it kind of just got rid of that. So 
I'm not not promoting it for that particular reason, but for me personally, I found that it got kind of got rid of the coffee jitters that I would get. And hey, I don't even have to take it anymore. I haven't taken C-Lank for weeks, but for me personally, it kind of, it got rid of that uh, physical feedback loop where you start feeling some tension in your chest and these types of things. For me, that's what it did. What was your experience with C-Lank? Uh, both C-Max and C-Lank, I think when I originally took them, they had more of an impact. And then after a while, I didn't really notice anything. I haven't used them for a while. Actually, I think the reason I stopped using them is because they're intranasal and they were slightly irritating my sinuses. So that was the only thing. But if, if in terms of actual impact and effect, I thought it was uh, you know, anything between very good to not much, but never anything negative. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I like yeah, that. I've never taken anti-anxiety medication. I used to take Cava Cava and some other things. And in my book, I recommend uh, quite a few different herbal things that people can try to to reduce their anxiety while they're healing their gut and things, and you know, getting their life in order. Because obviously, having a a stressful life can lead to anxiety and stress, also. Yeah, very much so. Um, I was thinking when you were talking about caffeine earlier, L-theanine could be pretty good as well for uh, smoothing out the edges of that. So it's interesting, c had the same effect. They're both, you know, probably increasing GABA, so that makes sense. Yeah, I like putting lion's mane uh, powder in my coffee too. So sometimes I'll take it with L-theanine and lion's mane. Anyway, I don't know. There's all kinds of cool things people can experiment. I know guys like you and me kind of get a kick out of this stuff. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, yeah, optimization, which is really cool. Um, and yeah, just get back to what you said about coffee, a lot of people who are fans of this podcast also fans of a guy called Ray Pete, Dr. Ray Pete. I don't know if you've heard of him, but uh, if you haven't, I would check him out. He believes coffee is extremely beneficial and he even classed it as a vitamin, believe it or not. So Good. Uh, <laughs> Ray, if you want go. to hear some justification for uh, <laughs> your coffee use, check out the work of Dr. Ray Pete. Well, thank you so much, uh, Craig uh, Brocky, author of Ultimate Health. It's been a pleasure to have you on here. Check out all the stuff that uh, he mentioned earlier that yoga maker i would have tried it myself already but i think it only ships in the u.s but i think about half of our viewers and listeners are in the u.s so that's still available to plenty of people uh thank you so much for your time it's been really fun and uh, i appreciate you thanks i would really appreciate you having me hey thanks for watching the video if you enjoyed that i recommend watching our latest episode which you can do by clicking above and make sure to subscribe like the video comment and share with anyone who you think might appreciate it thank you